Yeah, man, you're looking spare time, you know. I'm not, not sparing any time today. Anyways, lessons. All right, so here we are, operational amplifier. This is a unit, unit two um, lesson, and it is very important, right? It's a unit two lesson, right? And this falls under module, module two, right? Operational amplifiers. I mean, you see, it's good when you watch the video on. Let me hope I have everything on that video, but. The, the, the whole thing on electronics, having an understanding of that, it will be very good. Another thing, having an understanding of transistors is also good. I believe I sent you the PowerPoint with all the notes that you really required to um to to to, to, to know and and um, read up on, right? A transistor is really a, a semiconductor device, and it is really used for amplification, right? But no. We're going to look at a thing what we call operational amplifiers. It's really a semiconductor device. In most cases, it, it, they, they are made up of transistors. As we said just now, a transistor is an, is an, is an uh, amplifier, or it, it, it is used to amplify current or voltage, right? But we're going to look at how operational amplifiers work in itself. As the word says, it's operational. It's going to perform an operation. And when it performs that, that operation, it's now going to amplify the, the signal that comes in, right? So we're going to look at it. Now here, 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 here it is that we say an operational amplifier is pretty much integrated in, in circuit, right? To produce some amount of amplification, or in some cases you will hear us saying it, pro it, 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 it produces a, a gain in the voltage, right? It says, in other words, the purpose of an amplifier is to produce an output signal that is larger than the input signal. So that's what you're doing. It's like you're taking um, nothing and making it into something for the most part. Or you're taking um, a little bit of flour, just like when Jesus fed the, 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 the multitudes, right? He took five barley loaves and probably two fishes, and he multiplied it. In this case, he was performing an operational amplifier. So here we are talking about operational amplifiers. We're taking a small input voltage and we're now making the output larger. That's what we're essentially doing. Here are some um, pointers or some of the operation that the operational amplifier does. One, it acts as a switch. When voltage reaches a certain level, that's one. It says here that it amplifies direct voltages. That's two. It amplifies alternating voltages. And importantly, it compares two voltages and gives an output that depends on the result of the comparison. Right? That's the beautiful thing about operational amplifier. So when we look at the design of it, you will see certain things coming out. Right? Now, a typical name that we call operational amplifiers are what we call op amp, right? So you hear somebody in the electronic world says op amp or you know, I mean amplifier. It's the same thing as operational amplifier, right? So let's proceed and see. You see, when it comes down to operational amplifiers, there are certain things that we must know, right? Firstly, we must know the diagram, the schematic diagram for an operational amplifier. So it's like a triangle, right? Now, it has two inputs. It has two inputs. One input is going to be negative, and the other input is going to be positive. It has one output. Now, mind you, the first input here, which is the negative input, that input is what we call the inverting, the inverting input terminal. Inverting the reason why we call it inverting is because it is negative, right? Inverting. Now, the positive terminal is called the non-inverting input or non-input, non-inverting um, non terminal, right? Now, as it relates to the operational amplifier, it's a device that must be turned on, right? 
So there has to be a, what we call a power, a power supply, right? So right here is where I connect my positive connection to the positive to the power supply or to the operational amplifier. And here's where I, I connect the negative. So these are just your power supplies mainly, right? That's where you have to connect the wires and all of that. Any, any comments so far? No. All right, perfect. By the way, uh, on this page right here, well, not on this page, but this one, this is basically how it looks in real life, but inside of the board, it take a lot of crazy stuff are happening inside of it. So if you've ever opened a, 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 a device before, you might see stuff like these, right? Connected in maybe like a, a, a old, um, what you call it, old computer, you see stuff like these right here. These are just, we'll call them integrated circuits where it has a lot of operational amplifiers connected inside of it, right? So I had, I had the experience to use a few of these when I was at university, right? I mean, I'm telling you, it, it wasn't a normal thing. Like, it's crazy when it comes to the electronic world. I don't know how some guys do it, but they're good at it. Anyways, these are- Um, sir. Yeah, go ahead. Um, can you go back to the, um, the, the amplifier, please? Did I... Okay, right there, the positive supply. You said what was, what was happening there again? Yes, so, so in order for the operational amplifier to, to um, amplify a voltage, right, you would need a power supply that will give it that amount of voltage that it needs. So, that, so that's basically just like you turning on something, like if you're going to connect a, 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 a light bulb to somewhere, you would need a supply. So it's just like that. So the operational amplifier needs some amount of voltage, right? For it to work, obviously. You see what I mean? So we we'll soon talk a little bit more about the power supply scenario. We we'll soon talk a little bit more about that because that is very important as it relates to the output. Because what you're going to realize is that Campbell, if 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 I supply positive nine volts here and negative nine volts here, what that tells me is that when my signal is amplified. I cannot exceed what I, I, I start out with, right? So we soon come to that point because that is very important in understanding how operational amplifiers work. But before we do that, there is something what we call an ideal operational amplifier. Now, guys, these can be confusing. However, you just have to look at it from an ideal standpoint. Give me a second here. Yeah, that, that's a good idea. Um, and I, yeah, I should have let you guys know that for your exam, it is three questions, right? For your paper two exam. The thing is, it's a very tricky scenario because what it does, it limits you with, because back in the days you had six questions, right? Um, the first question obviously would be a module one question. Then question four would be a module one question and it would be a different topic. However, when you, when you have one question now, right, from, from module one, what it does, it, it clamps the question to one topic mainly, right? It kind of makes it be more narrow in terms of the topics that um, the question can come from, right? But, um, you know, it shouldn't be that hard just to see it, right? You guys just have to just apply yourself. Um, now, back to this now, guys. Later on, we can talk a little bit more about what is going on there and there. Let me check if I have my recording up and running. Yes, it is. All right. So, guys, we were talking about ideal operational amplifiers, right? When you hear the word ideal, it's like it is in its perfect sense, you know? It means that this is what I will get, you know, um, and, 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 and nothing else, so to speak. It, 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 I don't know how to describe it from a, from a worldly standpoint. I'm trying to see if I can find an example, right? But you see, like Jesus, no, who never sinned, you can treat him like an ideal operational amplifier because he didn't sin. When it comes down to, up, to ideal operational amplifier, this is what it does, right? Firstly, the first property of an 
ideal operational amplifier is that it has infinite input impedance, right? It has infinite input impedance. Now, what this means is that impedance, somebody go ahead and type in impedance on the internet. Impedance means resistance for the most part, right? So if I have infinite input resistance for argument's sake, what that means to me is that there is no current going to the input terminal. So if we go back and draw the ideal upper, or draw the, the symbol for the operational amplifier, here is my terminal, my negative and positive terminal, power supply, my output. Now it is telling us that in an ideal sense, right, my input has infinite input impedance which just tells me that i have so much i have a very large resistance that is infinitely large that it is not going to allow any current to pass through the the the, the or go towards the operational amplifier so it says that no current enters or leaves the input you see what i mean yes Somebody, somebody did research the word impedance and see what it means? Uh, yes, sir. What it mean? Resistance? Uh, so basically it's saying that it's effective resistance of an electric current or components to alternating current. Precisely. Guys, we know that there is no such thing. We can't have infinite resistance. That is crazy, right? But in, in, the, in the ideal world of an operational amplifier, we are saying, because that is what you're going to see from time to time when you do electronics and so forth. You're going to have ideal conditions, and then you're going to have, you're going to have a real condition. You see what I mean? So we'll soon talk about the real conditions, but we have to talk about the ideal ones first. Now, the next one here is that there is zero output impedance. So what they're now saying is that at the output, right, there is zero resistance. If there is zero resistance, what that means is that all of, there's nothing that is going to be stopping the current from flowing through the, the output. So what it says here, it says that the, um, the whole of the output is seen across the load connected to the output. It just tells us that there's nothing that is going to, prevent my output from, 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 from coming out, right? So there's no resistance at, at, the, at the output, according to them. Zero output impedance. Now, the next thing here is that it has an infinite open loop gain. It has an infinite open loop gain. Now, here's what this means. It says that this means that when there is only a very small input voltage the up the amplifier will saturate and the output will have the same the same value as the power supply right so what you're saying is that the operational amplifier is so designed that regardless of the input regardless of the input the operational amplifier is going to amplify the, the the signal right to the maximum amount that was supplied to the operational amplifier so regardless of the input so if the input is even 10 so for argument's sake right it's going to bring it, it's going to amplify the thing up to a point where it saturates. I still will explain what saturation means and what, what, what the saturation of, uh, looks like in an operational amplifier. But you just have to understand that there is infinite open loop gain, all right? Which just tells us that the thing is going to amplify the signal up to a point where it's going to always saturate. All right, very good. Now, another thing that we, we, we must talk about, I soon talk about this part here, talking about gain, how we find the gain of an operational amplifier. 
but what I want to talk about here is what we call the infinite slew rate, right? This is um, something, if you can type in on the internet, what, what does it mean by slew rate? Slew rate really talks to how much time delay uh, exists between the input and the output, right? Because what you have to understand is that when the input signal Imagine that this is your input signal, and we're talking about things like these, right? This is this is your input signal. When this input signal comes to the to the uh to the terminal here, what we're saying is that there's infinite slew rate, which just simply means that um as soon as the input signal comes to this terminal, right, it is going to instantaneously allow it to be amplified, right? So in essence, we're saying that the time delay is, is, is little to none. It says that with infinite slew rate, there is no delay. So, there, so normally, when you're amplifying something, it takes a time for it to amplify to the highest amount. In infinite slew rate, we're saying here that there is no time delay. Once the signal reaches the input, it's the same time it is going to um, is going to amplify, it. and this is, this is this is in the ideal setting. This is in the ideal setting. You follow me? Yes, sir. Perfect. Now there is a specific formula, guys. It's a very important formula for when you want to find the gain. The gain is just a number. Right, it's an arbitrary number that just tells you how much time your your input is. Uh, or, let me say, it's how much time your, or in a sense, how 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 large your. Let me, it's right here. I'm, I'm, I don't know. I'm trying to kill myself. Now it says that the the voltage gain, or simply the gain of an operational amplifier, is a measure of how many times the output is greater than the input, right? So if you were to define the, 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 the gain of an operational amplifier, it's really how much time the output is larger than the input signal. Because remember now that it is the output signal that is being amplified. And you want to know how many times that has been amplified. So if you want to find how many times that has been amplified, then you just divide it by the input, right? And that will tell you your voltage gain. All right? We'll soon look at questions related to it. But just remember the formula that says voltage gain is equal to output voltage divided by input voltage. Cool. So that's a formula that we must remember, right? I'm going to see if I can get some water. Just give me a second here. Anytime we talk about voltage, right, our operational amplifier, right, we have to remember the formula for voltage gain, or you will hear it simply talk about the gain. Okay, guys? Okay. No. How many of you are still there? You're still there? Yes. Perfect. Now here are the here are the real characteristics or the real properties of operational amplifier, right? So remember when we talked about the ID sense a while ago, we say it has infinite um, open loop gain. This is the open loop gain in the real world. It is 10 to the power of 5, right? 10 raised to the power of 5, which is basically 10,000, right? So this is the amount of times a typical operational amplifier. Is it a 10,000? No, it's 100,000. My bad. 100,000. This is the amount of times that an ideal, well, not an ideal, but a typical 
operational amplifier can amplify a signal, right, in its, in its real sense, good? As it pertains to the input impedance, remember when we said that in the ideal sense it has infinite, which means that no current flows into the operational amplifier? Well, in the real sense, it has a very high resistance between a million ohms to uh, basically one pico um, ohms, because 10 to the 12 means pico, right? So these are very high resistance. If we were supposed to write out um, the resistance, at the input, this is what it looks like. This is a very high, this is 1 million ohms. Then when you consider this, this one right here, right? It is one, um, that's gonna be a lot of zeros, right? Possibly another set of zeros, cool? This is the amount of resistance that we're saying that is at the input, cool, between that range. Now, as it relates to the output, guys, remember when we said that the, the, um, the output impedance, that the output impedance was zero for the ideal scenario? No, for the, for the real world scenario, it is at least 100 ohms. So it has some resistance. Guys, the reason why it's happy to have some resistance is the fact that the output is going to be made of some conductors. And if you have any type of conductor, it's going to have some level of resistance or impedance to it, all right? There's another thing that I didn't make mention of first, but when it comes down to what we call the bandwidth, right? We'll soon talk about what we mean by bandwidth, but in this case, we're saying that um, in, the, in, the, in the ideal scenario, it has infinite bandwidth, which means that all frequencies are amplified by the same amount that's what it means when we talk about um, infinite, uh, you know, bandwidth. However, when it comes on to the real scenario, it has a defined um, bandwidth. It, there, there, there's a set of frequencies that it will only amplify. Not all the signals or not all the frequencies it will amplify, okay? And you will see us talking more about bandwidth further on. Now, we made mention of the slew rate. We said it was infinite um, in, the, in the ideal world. In the real world, we're saying it's a finite number, which means that there is a slight, you know, um, delay in the amplification. All right? I hope, I hope these things make sense. Can you please repeat? Yes, the last thing I said was that um, for the for the flu rate, it has a finite value, which means that there is a small delay in the in the in the amplification process. At first, in the ideal world, we said that there is an infinite flu rate, which just tells us that all the um there you know there wasn't any delay in uh, as it relates to that. But as as as, as we can see now, it has a, a finite um, slew rate, which just shows that there is some amount of um, delay in the transition from input to output, all right? Okay. All right, wonderful. No, we Wait, um, can you go ahead a little bit, a little bit, so this is Thank you. All right. Oh my God. So you can't tell me so people then. All right. Okay. Now, here's one purpose of the operational amplifier. We spoke about it in some regards, right? If we, if I were to go back to the to, to the page about the uses of the operational amplifier, we see where it was used to amplify um, uh, direct voltages and so on. In this regard here. Right, we are going to see the operational amplifier working as what we call a comparator. Now, as the word suggests, comparator, 
it's it's almost coming from the root word or not almost it's coming from the root word compare so what the operational amplifier is about to do it is going to compare the voltages that are at the input now depending on what is at the input it will determine what the output will be now there's an equation right here as you're seeing on the screen it's a very important equation right which just shows that this is how you would find your output signal right by considering the gain of the operational amplifier so by the way this is the gain so a naught is the gain right generally speaking the symbol for a is well a naught is the open loop gain by the way it's the open loop gain so don't uh just, just be mindful of that overall a represents the gain if you want to talk about the gain you sometimes use a to represent it but what we're seeing here is that uh my output voltage right is equal to my open loop gain right times the difference between the voltage at the non-inverting terminal and the voltage at the inverting terminal so v plus is the voltage at the non-inverting v minus is the voltage at the inverting terminal any comment Any comments, guys? No, How sir. do you get the gain? How do we get the gain? Now, generally speaking, the, the operational amplifier is designed by nature to give you a particular gain. So remember a while ago, we were looking at the table, and we said that this is the value. Of the I of the of generally this is really the value of the open loop gain. So in most operational amplifiers that you will see, it will have this amount of gain, meaning that it is designed to amplify the signal by a thousand, not a thousand, by a hundred thousand, my bad. So it is designed that way. You understand me? So it, so it all has to do with the design mechanism of the operational amplifier. It doesn't have a unit. No, no, no. It's it just it doesn't have any unit. It 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 it's a just a constant in a sense, just a value. As I said, it it just speaks to the number of times the 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 output has been amplified, basically, right? Or the number of times the input has been um. Yeah, it's just a measure of the, how many times the output. Is greater than the input basically right and because you're dividing how we find the, the gain is by voltage divided by well voltage divided by voltage which is going to cancel out the unit so it's just a value i have less than a minute so i'm going to restart the session right so let's join back on very quickly so we can proceed all right so we have a whole lot of other stuff to talk about here all right yes so I think we were talking about, I don't remember, but this equation, you see, whenever we get a question related to comparators, right, you have to use this equation to find out what my output voltage is going to be like, okay? We will look at questions very soon as it pertains to that, but there is something specific or very important that you're going to see happening here as it relates to comparator. Now, it says that a, com uh, a comparator is when the voltage at the input or at the inverting and the non-inverting terminals are compared and then gives an output that depends on whether um, whether the input at the non-inverting is greater than the input at the inverting or uh, the, 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 the input at the non-inverting is greater than the input at the, uh, the non-inverting. Right. Here's a, here's a typical question. It says, let's consider the case where 
the inverting amplifier, not my bad, the non-inverting input rather, right, has a voltage of 0.95 volts and the inverting terminal, right, has a voltage of 0 0.94 and has a gain of times 10 to the 5. It says here that the supply is, or the supply voltage are at plus or minus 6 volts. By substituting into the equation, the output voltage is given by V out is equal to the gain, right, times the difference between the voltage at the non-inverting and the inverting. When we get the answer, we realize that that is equal to 1,000 volts. So let's look at the question. Let's look at the equation. So V out right, is equal to um, A naught, which is the open loop gain, times the voltage at the non-inverting minus the voltage at the inverting. At all times, ladies and, well, there's no gentlemen here, right? So ladies, um, at all times, you have to write the equations as such. If you, if you write it incorrectly in terms of writing the voltage at the inverting first, and then write the voltage at the non-inverting after, then it's going to be wrong, right? So don't do that. In this case, positive comes before negative. So now let's put in the values. My gain is 10 to the 5, 10 to the power of 5. My, my non-inverting is 0 0.95 minus the, the voltage at the the inverting. I was want, I was want to ensure that I said the correct thing. So this voltage that is right here, the 0 0.95, is the voltage for the non-inverting. The voltage that I'm about to write now is the voltage for the inverting, which is 0 0.94. So if we work the bracket out first, right? If we work out the bracket first, I'm going to get in the bracket 0 0.01. And that is multiplied by... 10 to the power of 5. Okay? If you have any if you have your calculators, you can try this and see if you get the same answer. You should get at least um, a thousand. So 10 to the power of 5. times 0 0.01, that is a thousand. So this is what happens now, guys. Yes, sir. Perfect. But by the way, it's not just any type of thousand. It's positive, okay? It's positive 1,000, right? No. What, what was the power supply that we, that we, um, we supplied to the system? What value was the power supply? Pardon, sir? What? Um, the supply voltage? Yeah, what was the supply voltage? Is that supply voltage, um, is that um, six, approximately six volts? Plus or minus, that, that sign means plus or minus. Yes, but like, would it still be like approximately, like no. give or take? No, 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 that, that's not the sign for give or take. Give or take is this. Give or take is this kind of thing here. That's not what that is saying. That is just saying plus or minus six volts. So it's, wait, so it's saying it's either positive or negative six? Yes, that's what it is saying. Because what you go, what you realize. Okay. Um, when it comes down to operational amplifiers, there are two voltages that are connected to it. Remember, we said that there's a negative connected here and there's a positive one connected here. So these are essentially the areas that the voltage is connected to. So you have one that is, neg that is negative and one that is positive. Now, if, if, I, if I'm using a power supply, right, that has six volts, 
But when I work out my calculation, I get a thousand votes at the end. Does that does that make that does, is that is that correct in any way? Let, let me know if, what you think about that. Can I can I start out with? Sir, um, I'm sorry. Can you please? Yes, I'll repeat. So we just said that our power supply is six volts, right? You got that part? Yes. And when you look at the output, what is the output? How much is the output? Anybody here? Sir, I'm sorry, what was that? Uh, what is the output? What was the output we got here? Oh, um, a thousand volts. A thousand volts. So I'm asking the question now. Is it possible for me to start out with six and then get a thousand? No, like how? No, sir. Exactly. So what we're seeing here is that I'm getting positive 1,000, right? What the, what the operational amplifier is doing, right? Because we know that it can't, we can't get a 1,000 volts. In, in it, in it, in it, that's what it wants to give us, but we can't get that because we did not start out with um, enough so that it can give us that amount. So in that scenario, right, we say that the amplifier becomes saturated. All right? And when the, when the operational amplifier becomes saturated, what you're going to realize is that the output is going to be what was supplied. So just a while ago, we said what was supplied was 12, right? So at the end of the day, because it is greater than the, the, the output that we got a while ago was greater than, 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 than 6, it is now going to make the, the, the output voltage be, 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 uh, be equal to 6, basically, right? So we say that it becomes saturated because the operational amplifier has reached its maximum potential. You understand? It can't go above that amount so we say it's now saturated you follow me yes sir perfect this is a very important thing you see for us to make note of and this thing right here it says that if the voltage at the non-inverting terminal is greater than the, the voltage at the inverting terminal the output is going to be positive at the end just a while ago we saw that when we look at the non-inverting the voltage was 0.95 and the voltage at the inverting was 0 0.94. So this tells us that my output obviously was positive because of that nature. Now, what if my inverting voltage is greater than my non-inverting, then my output is going to be negative of the power supply, right? So what you're seeing happening here, guys, is that the operational amplifier is comparing the voltage that is supplied to the to the to the to the input terminal. So if 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 my inverting terminal has more voltage, then my power supply is going to favor that voltage than the one that is at the non-inverting. Similarly, if my input at the non-inverting is greater, my power, my operational amplifier is going to favor that 
of the of of, of the of, of the of the non-inverting, and so hence I would get a positive output. I wonder if you're following me. Yes, sir. Okay, good. Wonderful. All right. Now there are there are several uses of of the operational amplifier, right? We can use operational amplifiers um, alongside with potential dividers, right? To basically uh, turn on and turn off certain circuits. I hope that maybe in the next lesson or not next next lesson, but next slide, we'll see an example of what we mean, right? I think I'll show you very soon. But yeah. So this is an example, right? Of of, of, of an operational amplifier working as a comparator in its in its in its natural sense. Alright, uh let me see here. Um right, um, Okay. All right. So you can read the information right there. So what we're looking at is basically a comparator. If you go in an exam and you see something like this, you're actually looking at a comparator. And when we say that comparator is it's basically comparing the voltage at the input and at the non-input terminals. Now, let's look at it. It says that we have two resistors of equal resistance, right? provide an input voltage of uh, three volts at the, at, the, at the inverting terminal. So this is where the, 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 the inverting terminal is connected. Now, one thing you have to remember is that if, if this resistance is the same as this one, then what it tells us is that the voltage that is across this resistor, right, is going to be the same voltage across this resistor, meaning that they're going to have the same value of resist of um of voltage because they have equal resistance. Okay, but on the other side, we have another potential divider coming up here. Right now, it says that when the LDR, which is what we call a light dependent resistor, so uh, there are some components, well, this is one component, right, that we call an LDR. And what it does is that it, the resistance changes when, 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 um, when light hits it, basically, right? So with that being said, it says here that when it is in the dark, right, its resistance is greater than 10 Kilo ohms, so it's greater than 10 kilo ohms. Now it says that the voltage at the non-input non terminal will be greater than 3 volts and the output will be positive 6. So let's look at this here. Imagine that if this voltage is greater, if this is greater than 10 kilo ohms, right? What we're going to see here is that this resistor is going to require more voltage than this 10K resistor. So the higher the resistance is the more voltage it is going to require, right? Hence, when we put, when we connect our input, or our, our, our non-inverting terminal to this end, it's going to recognize a much higher uh, uh, voltage, which just tells us now that the operational amplifier is going to output positive 6 because chances are 
the operational amplifier is going to saturate. I hope you know you heard me clearly. I know that my internet might be a little bit um, on the shaky side. Yes, sir. I can hear you. Yes, sir. All right. Perfect. So, so I think I might have a question. I, I, I know that there was something wrong with the question at one point, but I think I might have it, right? Where we can look at this in itself as a comparator, right? Because what you're essentially seeing, you know, guys, is that the thing is just comparing the voltage. So let me just kind of erase this a little bit, right? So based, based on this right here, if I connect my non-inverting terminal right here, right? When this voltage is greater than 10 kilo ohms, it means that it's going to require more voltage. And when it requires more voltage, that voltage is going to be greater than three. Remember at first, the, the voltage at the in, inverting terminal would have been three, three volts because of the fact that they have the same resistance. So they're going to have the same potential drop across them. Know that this, resistor, this resistance is the highest value. It's going to require more voltage. And when it is requiring more voltage, it means now that because the non-inverting is connected in between it, it's going to show us that the input, the, the, the inverting, the non-inverting rather, is going to have a much larger voltage there. Hence, it's going to now amplify the signal, or not only amplify it, but it's now going to compare it and say, hey, the one at the positive is greater. So at the end of the day, I must have a positive output, which is basically uh, high. Let me see here. Uh, what is that? Say? No. Okay, that's a different part of it. Okay, yeah, so it's going to be positive six. Now, let's look at it now. It says that in, in, in daylight, right, the, the resistance of the LDR will be less than 10 kilo ohms and the voltage at the non-inverting will be less than three volts all right so in this regard now if my voltage across my non-inverting terminal is less than three then what it now tells me is that my output is no longer positive it's now going to be negative because the inverting terminal has a much larger voltage. So therefore, at the end of the day, my output now will be negative output. How we see it? How we see it? Talk to me. Sorry, can you please repeat that last word? Yes, the last thing I said a while ago was that um, the once you realize that the inverting terminal is greater, right, than the output, than the, than the non-inverting in terms of the voltage, then the output terminal is going to be negative and it's going to have the maximum amount that was supplied to it. Okay. Yeah. All right. So hopefully I have a question around here. All right. This question no. I think I think the power supply here was um it, let me say that this is gonna be positive. Plus, plus or minus nine. So this is going to be nine. This is going to be minus nine here, All right? I think that was the problem with the question. I but either way, that you don't know the problem. Now let's go along. Let's see what this question says. It says that uh, a thermistor, right? No, a thermistor is a temperature sensing uh, device where its resistance changes with temperature with um with, with, with changes in temperature 
So please be mindful of the different types of, of, of resistance, right? Be mindful of that to say that, you know, we just looked at two different types of resistors. We looked at an LDR a while ago, which is what we call a light dependent resistor, right? And that resistance changes with, um, with light. Now, when we talk about a thermistor, a thermistor now is a temperature sensing device that is used in, in, in your refrigerators and, um, you know, anything that has to do with temperature change in a, on a whole, right? Maybe the AC as well and all of that kind of crazy stuff. In some cases, you will call thermostats as well. Maybe further on you'll hear about thermostats. But yeah, let's continue though. So a thermistor is included in the circuit as shown. It says at six degrees Celsius, the thermistor has a resistance of three, um, three kilo ohms. It says calculate the resistance of R such that the output of the operational amplifier will change polarity at six, six degrees Celsius. I am trying to understand if I cop copy this question correctly. I don't know, but um, if you're trying to find R, right? Yes, I think we can find R. I think so, can we find R? Uh, would you be able to again find R? If they would, yeah. it changes polarity. They say it changes polarity. Um, or will change polarity. Yeah. But, um. I I think I need to go back to this question at some other time. I I, I don't I don't remember what there's something wrong with this question at, at some point, right? Um. So I'm, I might not be able to can run through this one. I know there's something wrong with it. I should have gone back to check it out, but either way, right? Um, but I'll, I'll definitely uh, just remind me about this one, please, so I can go back to the book and look at it and see what exactly that I might have missed out in some regards. Because as you can see, a while ago I had to be writing in the values here, but we'll get back to that one. Now, this is just an example right of, of of basically an a comparator in itself working right here right so it says that a particular plant requires that an ambient temperature be between uh 18 degrees celsius and 21 degrees celsius for the plant to survive right it says that a student design a circuit that will be used to monitor the temperature of the room, right, where the plant grows. It says that the LEDs, right, which is what we call light-emitting diodes, L1 and L2, emit, emit rather light when the output from the appropriate amplifier is positive and high. It says here that the, that the term mister, right, has a negative temperature coefficient. So it says at a temperature of 18 degrees Celsius, the potential difference ac across R is 4.5 um, volts. So let's see what's going on here, guys. I think it might be a question, or yeah, maybe I left off a piece of it, but let's look at it and see which one of these lights will, will be turned on, right? So when, when the temperature is at 18 degrees, good? It just told us a while ago that the voltage across R is going to be 4.5 volts. So what that tells me is that that voltage is going to come here, it's going to go here, and it's going to go here. Similarly, that voltage is going to come here and here. Now, already we have a, a set voltage at this non-inverting terminal, which is 4 volts. And at the top one, I have a voltage of, um, of, 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 of five, five, 5 volts. Now, based on this, guys, 
the the output the output here is going to be uh, negative. It's going to be negative, right? Because of the fact that this five at the inverting terminal is greater than that at the input terminal. All right. But 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 there's something tricky about the the, the the LEDs, right? There's something tricky about the LEDs, right? Uh, you know. LEDs work in such a way that this side is the positive side and this side is the negative side, right? When you watch the lesson on um on 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 on, on um what you call it when you watch the lesson on 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 um electronics you'll get a better understanding. But what you're gonna see is that not because this one has a higher voltage means that this this light is gonna turn on. The 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 the, the light here has to work off of a mechanism what we call forward biasing and when something is in forward bias it means that the the positive terminal right is is connected to the positive end of the of the of, of the of the, the the light emitting diode let's look back at this one um let's see here let's see let's see let's see so this voltage is going to be um 4.5 so at this terminal, which is the non-inverting terminal, the voltage is 4.5, right? Which just tells me now that my output is going to be positive. My output is going to be positive, right? I don't know what the value might be. Whether it be positive 12, it doesn't matter for now. Let's just say positive 12. Now, remember, I was talking about the LEDs a while ago. Right, the LEDs, they are basically diodes, right? They are diodes. And the typical symbol for a diode looks like this, right? Let me see if I can draw it over so you can get a better view of it. So here is my typical diode. This side of my diode is the negative side. This side of my diode is the positive side. Now, for a diode to work, ladies, right, it has to be connected in forward bias. Forward bias. What that means is that here is my power supply. This is my positive terminal of my battery and my negative terminal of my battery here. The negative terminal must be connected to the negative side of the, the, the diode and the positive side must be connected to the positive side of the diode. Now, when, when I look back at this scenario, right, the only LED that will light up is the one that has the positive going towards the the the, the, the positive side because remember this side is positive and this side and the output is positive so this is an LED, led that will essentially light up because of the fact that um positive and positive are going together the whole reason why the output is positive is because the, the input here at the non-inverting is greater than that of the input at the non -in at, 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 the, at the inverting so for that reason it now makes our output becomes positive let me just pick up in here and just allow you guys to ensure that you are understanding say that again i think it's report and it kind of went down like the internet kind of um went down a bit and, and it came back fully when you were explaining um the um the forward oh you kind of get kicked off in a sense forward bias yes, no sir, i was i was still on but it was oh if you could go over forward bias like one more time because it was breaking up a lot for me okay okay all right okay guys so yes as I was saying a while ago, right? 
you when you watch that lesson, you will see something called what we call a diode, right? And I implore that after this lesson, you go and you watch that one as it relates to electronics because it's a must understand lesson, right? If you know you can't miss out that, right? Don't want you to miss it out any at all. So yeah. So a diode is a simple semiconductor device, right? Now how it works is that it works in, let, let me just say this, a diode acts as a switch for the most part, and in order for the switch to turn on, it has to be in forward bias. When, when a diode is in forward bias, it means that the positive terminal, right, of the, di of the diode, because the diode has a positive terminal and a negative terminal, now, that positive terminal of the diode must be connected to the positive end of the, of the cell or of the battery, right? Similarly, the negative terminal of the battery must be connected to the negative terminal of the, of the, of the, of the, of the diode. That is when the, the thing is in forward bias. And when it is in forward bias, it now it no works. Similarly, when you have an LED, by, by, by the way, we must be mindful of the symbols that we are using. So this is the symbol for an LED, right? Light emitting diode. So what that tells us now is that it's, it's, it's a diode in its nature. And for it to work, it has to be in forward bias. When we look at the questions here, it showed us a while ago that at the top here, this operational amplifier will give me an, a negative output. A negative going to a going to the positive end of the of the LED is going to cause it to be what we call reverse reverse bias. And in reverse bias, the LED the, the, the LED is not going to turn on. So the LED will not the LED will be will be off. Will be off. Right? But as it relates to the LED number one now, because my output is positive, positive and positive are now connected, this is the LED that will be emitting light because of the fact that it is now in what we call the forward bias scenario or the forward bias, um, you know, uh, yeah, forward bias basically. But you can ask the questions. Well, what was that? If you have a question, you can go ahead and ask it now. Mm -hmm. So the second one is the one that's on because it's both it's um connected to the positive side to the, the Yes. Diode's positive side. Yes. So, so the second one, which is LED one, right, would basically turn on, for because it is in forward bias. The top one will not turn on because that one is in reverse bias. Do you understand? Are we good? Yes, sir. All right. No. We 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 have been talking about open loop gain, right? So far and all of that. Yeah, I, I, my internet sometimes is is unstable i see the thing jumping up on my screen so it is unstable sometimes i really really hope you know i really wonder why these things have to be so challenging sometimes but yeah um just to just um you know allow us to understand what we mean by open loop we we talked about open loop gain and 
and you know you might have been wondering what it really means to us now in open loop right it means that there is no feedback from the output to the input that's what it means when you have an open loop right so in open loop there's no feedback from the output to the input it says that the gain of the operational amplifier under this condition is defined as an open loop gain all right so this is your typical operational amplifier where you have your input and you have your output. Whenever there is no, nothing connected from the input back to the, or from the output to the input, then this is in what we call open loop. If we go back to the question as it relates to operational amplifiers or comparators on a whole, right? Like a question like this, right? Or a diagram like this. There is nothing from my output that is going back to my input. So in essence, that is the reason why my, I have what we call open loop gain. Okay? That is the reason why we have open loop gain right, right, right here. But now, whenever I take a fraction of my output, and send it back to one of my input terminal. This is now what we call a closed loop, right? And I no longer have what we call open loop gain. I just have simply gain. So it's no longer called open loop gain, but it's just called, you could call it your closed loop gain if you want, but it is just the, the gain overall, like, right? you know? One of the things that you will understand if you look at this graph, right, this graph is showing us what happens when my operational amplifier is in open loop. When my operational amplifier is in open loop, I realize that my bandwidth is much, much smaller. I soon explain it because you might not understand what I mean by bandwidth, but I soon, I soon explain it. I have less than a minute. So I'll restart it and then now we, we pick up from there, all right? Right, so there is something spectacular about when we have amplifiers in in closed loop, in a sense, right? When we say that closed loop is when a fraction of the output is sent back to the input. Whenever that happens, there is something spe specific or spectacular that happens, you know, to to the to the overall bandwidth. Of the operational amplifier now when you look at this graph right here this right here is the open loop gain graph so it, it and i must make what I, what I want to tell you about bandwidth bandwidth you see is the portion of the graph where the gain is constant so right here from here to here the line is constant meaning that it is a straight line going across now as you can see at this point the line starts to dip so when it dips now, the gain is no longer constant. The gain is now changing. But right between here is what we call the bandwidth. And the bandwidth, as we said, is just um, a range of frequencies for when the gain is constant. Okay? So that's what the bandwidth... We'll soon talk a little bit more about it, right? But that is just the basic definition of what the bandwidth speaks about. Okay, now, when, when the operational amplifier is in closed loop, which means that there's a portion of my output that is sent back to the input, there are two, there are two things that happen. There are two things that happen. One, my bandwidth is much wider, which means that I have a, a much larger range of frequencies that that can can accumulate a gain of x amount right so when you look at this right here here's my gain 
my gain is constant for a much longer duration of, of frequencies. But the challenge though, or not the challenge, but the, the, the takeaway from this is that the gain is much lower. So the gain is no longer um, 100, but it is, it is much less than 100, which means that the signal um, is not going to be amplified to the highest amount, right? But however, the beautiful thing is that you have more frequencies that are able to be amplified within that, uh, that bracket. You understand? I want to yes, sir. Yeah. So we're going to look at the whole thing about feedback. Because it, it's a definition that we are not only a definition, but there, it, it's something that we must, um, must you know, be able to define as well. Because what, what you just looked at a while ago, as it pertains to the closed loop, the closed loop is working on a me working working off of a mechanism, what we call feedback mechanism, right? So when feedback occurs, what, what you're essentially seeing is that a fraction of the output is fed back to the input uh, of, the, of the operational amplifier. Now, there are two types of, of feedback. You have what we call negative feedback, and you have what we call positive feedback. In negative feedback, it says here that there is a reduction in the gain of the, of, of the amplifier, right? So what we looked at a while ago, we saw where when the, when, the, when the feedback was sent from the output to the input, we saw where that the, 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 the gain would have been reduced from 100 to maybe about 40, right? Now, that is just negative feedback. In most of your understanding of amplifier, or most of what we're going to talk about, we're really going to deal with what we call negative feedback. Now, it continues here to say that there are numerous advantages, right, for when we have, um, you know, negative feedback taking place. One that I spoke about a while ago was that the bandwidth is now much larger, right? So if you have the bandwidth much larger now, it means that you can have your gain or you can have those signals being amplified for a much longer or for a much wider range of frequencies. Now, you might be wondering what industry um, do we use these things in? When you, when you make a, a, simple, a simple telephone call, right? A telephone call works off of um, these input signals and you have uh, you know, amplifiers along the, along the line where it needs to amplify the signal. It's a very complicated process. But, you know, I mean, if, if, you're ever, if you ever have some free time on your hand and you sit down and watch a video on what happens when you make a phone call, typically, it's taking a much lower frequency of sound, not necessarily lower frequency of sound, but it's taking your input voice. So your voice is, is obviously... Um, low voltage for the most for the most part right and it's not going to take that and send it to through through maybe you know the, the the modem when it goes through that modem now it's going to amplify it to a certain degree so that you know maybe Campbell can hear me when I speak very loudly so it's a whole lot of crazy stuff that is happening you understand but, but what you have to understand though is that if, if the bandwidth is much larger right it means that the signal can remain constant or the, the amplification of my voice can remain constant for a longer duration of time, you know? So that's kind of like the whole aspect of, of this thing. You know, if, you have ever, if you're ever interested or are going to be interested in the telecommunication aspect of things, then you will see what we mean by bandwidth. When, when we talk about, um, you know, digital and talking about the bandwidth of their, their network and all of that, it's really talking about the range of frequency that you know you are able to 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 to, to tap into, right? When you hear we talk about um, 5G, right? 5G is just talk is just talking about 
a range of frequency, you know, that you are able to pick up or to use to transmit data. We, 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 if you go back to the, to, the, to, the, to the knowledge of 3G, you have 3G, you have 2G, all of those things. It's just speaking about what frequencies the information is being transmitted at, you know? And as we go further, right, by increasing the, the generation in, in, in the sense, right? Because 3G means third generation, by the way. It is just telling us that we are now transmitting our signals on a much wider bandwidth, right? So if you're transmitting the signal on a much wider bandwidth, then, you know, it, 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 makes, it gives a whole lot of advantage because if the bandwidth is much larger, then it means that you can transmit the signal for a longer period of time without having any challenges with transmitting the information, right? So it's a whole other thing. When you look at it again, it says here that there's less distortion that takes place when you have um, a thing such as uh, negative feedback. And we can understand that because if, if my bandwidth is much larger or, much, you know, or constant for a longer period of time, then you know, chances are it's going to reduce distortion in the signal. It also allows for greater stability as well. Now, what we mean by positive feedback, that is just simply when a portion of the, um, the input is sent to the output. And of course, if that occurs, what, what you're going to see is that the bandwidth is going to be reduced and it's going to create some instability to the whole thing. You don't have to know much about positive feedback, but negative feedback for sure, we must know that. All right. I hope I didn't chip out too much when I was talking. No, sir. No, sir. All right. Good, 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 good. All right. Um, let's see here. No, no. All right. So this is now another very important aspect. We have been talking about bandwidth, right? And so forth. No. In order for us to be accurate, right, about the, 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 the range of frequencies, right, that makes up the bandwidth, we have to take into account this, this information here, right? So what we're seeing here, right, let's imagine that we're looking at this graph. We're seeing that the line is constant right here which just pin, pinpoint um, that my gain is 40 decibels. Remember last time we talked about decibels? You remember we talked about decibels? Yes, sir. No. Yes, sir. What, what, why, is there, why, why do we record stuff in decibels again? Because it's um, a very, I think it was a very accurate scale and like this very... Um, very small scale, so the difference is not a lot, so it will be very accurate and precise. Yes, good. In this regard, we use the decibel scale because the gain is a very large value. You remember when we looked at the, 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 the open loop gain? What was that value for open loop gain that we looked at? In the real scenario, in the real scenario. I think it was it was 10 to the 5 or 10 to the 6. 10 to the 5. This is a very large number, which is what we call 100,000. Can you imagine you going into the exam and you have to be writing 100,000 on your graph, right? That is a very large value, which can cause problems. So in order for us to record large, large values, it's more recommended that we use a decibel scale, right? So, yeah, I, I'm talking about, so let's go back here now. So in order for us now to essentially calculate our bandwidth, right? 
Remember, we said that the bandwidth is basically a range of frequencies, right? For which the gain of the amplifier remains constant. If I, Raymond Douglas, want to find the, the gain, or not the gain, but the bandwidth, right? There is a special thing that we have to take into account, right? To be accurate about the bandwidth, I have to subtract three from my gain, right? And whatsoever value that corresponds to in regards to my gain and the corresponding frequency, that will determine what my bandwidth is going to be. So my bandwidth is not here. My bandwidth is at um, 37 uh, dB, which corresponds to this point on my graph. So my, my bandwidth is somewhere around here, you know, in between this, these, 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 these points, right? So it's a very tricky thing. It's a very tricky thing. But to be accurate and or to find the, the, the bandwidth mainly is for us to subtract 3 dB from 40. So if, if my maximum gain is, uh, is, is, uh, is 40, right? To find out the gain that corresponds to my bandwidth is by subtracting 3 decibels from the 40 decibels which I'm going to get 37 decibels. So I'm going to go back on my graph and I'm going to locate my 37 decibels and go all the way over on the graph whereby it touches the line. I'm going to extrapolate. I'm going to read the corresponding uh, X value, which is my range of frequencies. Because your frequencies are always on this side of your graph, by the way, guys. So your frequencies are always on this side of the graph. And also, your, your gain is on this side. So once I have located that, that point, it now tells me what my bandwidth is. So overall, all of this under here so, is my bandwidth. And that is essentially the range of frequencies for which my gain remains. Um, sir. Yeah, go ahead. Mr. Dallas? Yes, go ahead, please. Hello? Campbell? Sir. Isabel, you hearing me? Yes, sir. Campbell, what's up? I wonder if you understand. Um, not sure what's happening on your end, though, Campbell. Maybe it's your end because Isabel is hearing me. Campbell, let me know if you hear me now. Are you hearing me now? No? Yes or no? I don't know what's happening. On your end, Campbell. Okay. Is she there? I think she's just disconnected to come back on. But um, Isabel, you think you understand what's going on here as it relates to if I want to find my bandwidth, right? What I would have to go through to find the bandwidth. This is only one way, by the way, of finding the bandwidth, right? You think you can manage that? Um, yes, sir. So, 
The yeah. bandwidth is just the range of frequencies. Yambu, you hear me now? Yes, I can hear you now, but um, can you please explain this again? Because uh, the, the audio went out for a couple of minutes until I, I thought he probably left and then I saw the movements. I was like, what? So yeah, I didn't get anything. You're, you're just sitting here watching the screen, Campbell. Oh, it's been recorded, right? You can just like send it to us, I guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Watch it from there. It's a record, but we just say, you know, you're, you're sitting on watching the screen and, 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 and I probably wonder if, if Sarah talk or something, you know? <laughs> <laughs> if, if, if 30 seconds pass, you know, and you know, and you know, see nothing go on, then you most know there's something going wrong, <laughs> right? But, um, yeah, you know, anyways, um, yeah, so I can go back over that part, um, Campbell, just, just to just make you understand, because I don't want you to wait on the video, because sometimes, you know, say, on a, on a little music in the ears rather than listen, listening to a, a one or two lessons and so forth, you know. And Campbell is a prime example, because when we see Campbell the other day, right, Campbell have, Campbell have them, them earphones, they call them, <laughs> them, them, them earbuds, them earbuds in our, in our ears, you know what I mean? Like, you know, so she's well deaf on some sporting vibes. Yo! <laughs> <laughs> Sir, I actually went, <laughs> I actually went to do something for school. Yeah. What, you know? Yes, come on. Call it? No, guys! <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't know what's, we believe what? you. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my lord. <laughs> Anyways, you know, I mean, laughter is good. You know what I mean? Laughter is good. All right. So, so we were at the point, Campbell, right? And please don't, don't, um, if you drop off again, just let me know quickly, right? So, here we're at. We're at a section here where we're looking at a thing what we call the bandwidth. And we said what the bandwidth is already. The bandwidth is the range of frequencies for which the gain of the operational amplifier remains constant. But to really find the actual range of frequency, we, we, have, to, we have to take into account, you know, that the, the, actual, um, the actual bandwidth is at, you know, negative 3 dB of maximum output. So imagine that the, 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 the maximum gain is, is 40, right? To find out the, the actual frequency or the bandwidth, I have to subtract 40 from 3, and I'm going to get 37 decibels. When I get that 37 decibels, I'm now looking for the point on my graph where, you know, or where this line touches, or what point corresponds to 37. So I'm looking to see what point corresponds to 37. When I find that point, that point is now going to tell me my bandwidth, right? So that is really where you find your bandwidth. And as I was saying, this is only one way of finding Wait, it. um... Yeah. Hey, sir, on the three decibels here, um... Mm -hmm. Yes. So the, 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 the three decibels, it, it, it's negative three decibels, right? And that is just, I, yeah. I, don't, I don't know the complete reason for it, but it's almost like to be, to be more accurate in finding the bandwidth, you would, you would go down at least, you know, um, three decibels, right? When you go down to three decibels, in this case, I'm getting 37, right? So what I would do now is to just find the point on the curve that matches up with 37 and then now that range of frequency that touches oh. that what happened no 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 I, I was wondering like how i well, understand now oh okay yeah man so once you know the 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 the, 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 the gain right here this gain as i said is 40 right and to just be more accurate in the bandwidth 
is for us to just subtract three from the 40. At all times, by the way, at all times, it would be three minus in the gain. What if my gain was 100, right? It, it would be three minus 100, which is going to give me, um, you know, is that what, 90, 97. So you would look on your graph for 97, and then know the value that corresponds with that on the y axis on the x axis that is going to tell us the the, the the um the frequency right which is your bandwidth oh god it's a it's a lot you know it's a lot no the 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 bandwidth also right here is also referred to as as, as a matter of fact the 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 the, the, the frequency that is really the bandwidth is called a cutoff um frequency right it's what we call a cutoff frequency now here's like the, the the complete reason it's now it says that when we are um talking we're supposed to be talking when we're talking about gain right we can represent it as decibels where we say that in the decibels uh you know, um, this is saying 20 log. I'm wondering if it's really 20 here. It could be 20, you know. But I don't, I don't know why we say 20 here. I don't remember why we say 20. Right. Why did we say 20 here? Because I think last class we talked about decibels. I think, no, that, that, was, that was because we had to convert it from bells to decibels. But in this regard, right, whenever we want to convert from decibels to, to gain, to voltage gain, right, this is what we have to use. We have to use 20 log of base 10, right? So um, just kind of note the differences in a sense, right, when we use this. So I think we might have a question that we might use this for. Now, this is the reason here, guys, why we use um, the log scale. It says the log scales are used because it allows for a wider range of frequencies to be accumulated that are done than that, you know, on a, on, a, on a linear scale, right? So, in a sense, we're saying that the log scale allows for a much wider range of values to be recorded. Similarly, it says here that the y, the vertical axis, is marked in linear division, but uses um, logarithmic units of decibels, which allowing or allows for a much greater range within the same distance. So you know there are a lot of things going on here, right? Just talking about the different scales. And what modifications do we that we do to those skills to to, ena to enable us to can represent the large values that we're representing, right? So this is a typically example, typical examples of this is a linear scale. We know how a linear scale works already. Start maybe at zero, you go all the way up. When it comes on to a logarithmic scale, we start at one and not zero. Okay. So the log log of zero is is one let's check it out so log of zero oh no no that's that's a lie that's a lie uh let me see log of one log of one is zero it's the other way around my bad it's the other way around so log of one is zero now let's try log of ten log of ten is one so it's just showing us that if i was to represent um 10 um is it if i were to represent one on on a, on a, on a log scale that would correspond to be um log of base 10 because just a while ago i put in log of 10 log of 10 is equal to one now if i want to represent two on my log scale, then two corresponds to be um, log 
of 100. If you put log of 100 in the calculator, you get 2. And it continues. So if we put log of 1,000 in the calculator, we get 3. So it just continues all the way up to just show us that um, the log scale really just allows us to represent larger values so that it, it does not take away from the graph in a sense, right? So that's just really what's going on there. All right, now guys, remember I said to you that we can use, um, we can use, it's not only one method we can use to determine the bandwidth, right? There is another way we can use to, 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 to determine the bandwidth, and it's by using what we call um, linear approximation, right? So what you would essentially do is that you would take your ruler and you would draw some broken lines, right? Um, from on this portion of the line, of your curve, I should say, right? You just extrapolate it all the way up to here, right? Then this portion of the graph as well, you're going to find the tangent of, of this curve part. A tangent is like, if I have a curve like this, the tangent would be a line that just touches at one point, that just touches at one point. This is not completely straight, but this is kind of like what a tangent is. It just touch touch the line at one point. So in a sense, this right right here would be my tangent basically, and I would just draw a line right across wherever wherever both lines intersect. Wherever both lines intersect, so the lines intersect right here. So right here, the corresponding frequency that you would see on the graph here would basically be your bandwidth. Right, that would be your bandwidth. So there are two ways we have looked at, right? Two ways talking about the frequency, which is negative three dB of the maximum, right? And now we're seeing that we can use line approximation or linear approximation to find out what the um, the, 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 the the bandwidth can be, okay? No, I let me see what time is it. Um, yes. All right. Okay. Let me see if I can probably find a one. Um, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Listening, listening, Campbell. Go ahead. Um, yes, sir. Um, I have a question, but it has to do with on the labs. Like, um, before you go. Yeah, go ahead, please. Yes, go ahead, Campbell. Um, so, sorry about that, sir. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, sorry. <laughs> My dad called me. Uh, okay, so I have a couple a couple questions. It has to do with the photoelectric um, photoelectric effect. So, look, what I'm going to let me tell me that, Campbell. You know, tell me that all now. When I talk about that yesterday, man. Sir. Yes, sir. But um, when you reminded me, I was like, oh yes, I didn't finish calculating that. But before I go to that, like something a lot easier. Okay, so for the resistance graph, sir, when I tried to like um do the um, I did it already, but but when I looked back at it, the best fit line, and I know it's supposed to be like it has like it's supposed to be even. You said it has to be like equal amounts of points, mm -hmm. um, and on like opposite sides of the line. You said yes, not <laughs> it's not, <laughs> and yeah, yeah, yeah. Force. Um, go ahead. Let me hear that. Okay, and all one. Um, for the force and the wire, the same thing with the graph. I'm having problems with. Like, I don't. I don't have a problem. Like, I'm linear right in the equation. It's just that. Um, to. I don't know the force. It's just, supposed just, to be um a just, graph. Just, just right? try and get but, it. Get it to the best of your ability. You know, you don't have to kill yourself on it. Sir. I mean, yeah, go ahead. Sir, it does look like a line. It does look. 
Sir, it doesn't look like a line. It looks like an N. You have to tell me that. What do you mean like an N? What do you mean? Yeah, you have to tell me that. Same way you're talking about. You understand? I can see what you mean. Okay. <laughs> All right. Yeah. But my main problem is um, it's just the the yeah for the graph and for phys um two um where explained in the procedure that we should like add zero point five on the what do you call that? You know, which lab is that? Which lab is that about? The um capacitance lab for unit one. Mm -hmm. What, what about it? Okay, um, you said that we should, um, I can't remember the name of it, but, but we should increase it by like 0 0.5 each time until it goes up to five. But when I try to do that, yeah, it's, it, yeah, we can do that. It's just that if we did that, move from, from, from zero, this happens in, it started from one. So we had to increase it by 0 0.5 each time at each step. But that's a lot of steps, probably like, approximately like 30 something or I don't know like a lot so I don't know if that was like you don't know if you understand you don't know where you're actually sitting on I mean right I, I let me let, let's just go look at that because I, I let me just stop this thing here I didn't realize that the recording was still going on